You are watching KVU 25 at 10. Good evening and thank you for joining us on 25 News Now after the game. I'm Zach Brown. It's already time to talk weather on this Sunday night. It's been chilling down a little bit. It's been rainy. Meteorologist Scott Pitney has an update. Scott. Yeah, while we are enjoying a gorgeous weekend, we need to start paying attention to what's going on next week. The National Hurricane Center upping the chances of this disturbance in the Yucatan now to 80% still tracking these two systems out here. But what we're most concerned with is this system in the Bay of Campeche. Right now, the National Hurricane Center, the models are showing a pretty good agreement of the general direction of the system, starting off to the northwest and making a turn to the north and then eventually to the northeast. Now, how far it is from the coast is going to make a big difference in how much rain and wind affects the coastline. So we'll talk about that more in the forecast, but I want to show this image. This is the night vision satellite. If you look at these lights, this is the Yucatan Peninsula right here, and this shows the convection is building and getting a little bit more organized. So we're going to continue to see that develop. We'll likely see a depression in the next 48 hours and could see Francine as soon as Tuesday. We'll have all the details coming up in your forecast. Zach, back to you. Scott, thank you. Referio County deputy sees several firearms after a traffic stop on US Highway 77 on Wednesday. Deputy stopped a vehicle that showed a fake paper tag in the vehicle. Deputies found firearms hidden compartments and firearms wrapped in cellophane. Items seized included six scar rifles, one AK rifle, one AK pistol, two Glocks, multiple magazines for the rifles. Authorities say the firearms were believed to be headed to the border. Victoria County Commissioner's Court will meet Monday morning at 10. Commissioners will set tax rates for this year and they will adopt the budget for next year. The meeting will be at 101 North Bridge Street. The nation's largest bank is cracking down after an illegal and expensive TikTok trend went viral. JP Morgan Chase says a glitch allowed thousands of people to fraudulently withdraw money at ATMs by writing large checks to themselves. The viral videos show people depositing checks written for huge sums of money, then withdrawing a smaller but substantial amount of cash before the checks bounced. Social media made it sound like this was a bug and the money was free, but Chase says it is check fraud and those who did it could be prosecuted. The financial financial institution is investigating how many people were involved and how much money was illegally taken out. Summer 2024 on track to be the hottest year in recorded history. Scientists have confirmed this summer season broke global heat records for the second year in a row. According to the new data from Copernicus, summer in the northern hemisphere between June and August was the hottest since 1940. Last month in the Southern Hemisphere, Australia broke its national record for the hottest day with temperatures reaching nearly 107 degrees. The summer season typically ends with autumn equinox, which is on September 22nd this year. Bikers showed their support for the victim of Appalachia High School shooting in Winder, Georgia on Saturday. Over 100 motorcyclists from different clubs showed for the event, which was called Rally Around the Chi. The road began, or the ride rather, began at a pet store located a few miles away and ended in front of the high school. Four people were killed when 14-year-old Colt Gray allegedly opened fire Thursday. Nine others were also wounded, all but two of whom were shot. That's what we do. We rally around our neighbors. Our kids go to school in this school system. We want to be here to support, you know, all the kids, families, first responders, just to show up, you know, for them in this time. I mean, the message we're just trying to send out in this community is that we all stand together when something like this happens. So that's pretty much it. What's been the um, the reaction from that from other members of the community when I mean, you guys just showed up? Uh, what do you hear from them? I mean, it's just devastating for the whole community. Really, people can't wrap their minds around it. Gray was arraigned on four felony counts of murder on Friday. His father, Colin Gray, was also arraigned. He was charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter, two counts of second degree murder, and eight counts of cruelty to children. On Thursday, China's foreign ministry announced it is 
ending most foreign adoptions of Chinese children. The announcement put hundreds of American and other foreign families with pending applications in limbo. The only exceptions will be for foreigners adopting the children or stepchildren of blood relatives in China. Since the early 1990s, the country has sent tens of thousands of adoptees overseas with about half arriving in the U.S. For decades, China only allowed couples to have one child, forcing many, ch uh, many families to abandon children, but to slow down a falling birth rate. The government announced in 2015 it would allow married couples to have two children. In 2021, China began allowing three children per couple. The Internal Revenue Service says it has collected nearly $1.3 billion in overdue taxes from wealthy households since last fall. It says it's result of a ramp up of enforcement efforts funded by the Democrat-backed Inflation Reduction Act that Congress passed two years ago. The Biden administration has said increased enforcement actions will only target corporations and wealthy taxpayers who earn more than $400,000 a year. The Trump campaign has claimed the $80 billion expansion of the IRS is an example of reckless spending that has taken place under President Biden and Vice President Harris. The Independent Congressional Budget Office and other budget experts say spending money on tax enforcement can reduce the deficit by bringing in more tax revenue. Democratic vice presidential nominee Governor Tim Waltz's finances may be more in line of the average American rather than an average politician. The Federal Election Commission released new financial disclosures on Friday. Waltz reported a $210,000 income from January of 2023 through August of this year. That is from his job as governor of Minnesota. He also reported having a bank account with between 15 and 50 thousand dollars in cash. However, he does have a few retirement savings accounts as well as a pension income he will earn as a result of his years as a public school teacher. Previous disclosures showed Walt no longer owned a home or rental property. He also does report owning any individual stocks or bonds. He may also have a pension income from his years of service in the National Guard and his six terms in Congress. However, those are not required to be reported on the FEC form. The Republican presidential campaign has news as well. Former President Trump has announced Dr. Ben Carson will serve as the National Faith Chairman for his 2024 presidential campaign. Carson, a retired neurosurgeon and former presidential candidate, served as housing and urban development secretary in the Trump administration. He ran for president against Trump in the 2016 Republican primaries. Carson endorsed Trump's 2024 presidential bid last year. The first presidential debate between Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump just three days away, set to air right here on ABC Tuesday night. Both candidates making their final preparations as some new endorsements have come in, including one prominent Republican who plans to cross party lines come November. Vice President Kamala Harris in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where she'll be hunkered down with her staff this weekend as she prepares for her first debate against Donald Trump. Harris making a campaign stop Saturday at a local eatery. <laughs> She was greeted by an emotional supporter. We're going to be good. We're going to be fine. On Friday, the vice president getting a boost from one of the most prominent Republicans of the last 50 years. Former Vice President Dick Cheney saying that he will cross party lines and plans to vote for Harris, saying in a statement, there has never been an individual who's a greater threat to our republic than Donald Trump. He tried to steal the last election using lies and violence to keep himself in power after voters had rejected him. I'm honored to have their support, and I think it's an important statement right now, people are exhausted about the division and, and the attempts to kind of divide us as Americans. Former President Donald Trump, for his part, dismissing the endorsement, calling Cheney irrelevant. This week, he received an endorsement from the Fraternal Order of Police. Trump traveling to the battleground state of Wisconsin for a rally Saturday. Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. I'm not a threat. I'm the opposite. I'm going to I'm keeping democracy. Friday, he was in New York 
choosing to spend time appearing in court as his team appealed the jury's decision to award E. Jean Carroll $5 million in a sexual abuse and defamation case against him. The judge in his hush money case agreed on Friday to delay sentencing. He was convicted of 34 counts in that case of falsifying business records to cover up hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels. He had been scheduled to be sentenced in that case on September 18th before the election, but the judge moving that to November 26th. Mary Alice Parks, ABC News, Pittsburgh. All right, grab your cell phone and scan this QR code. This, hour, this is our quick response code to download the Crossroads Today app. Watch us anytime, anywhere, and get breaking news alerts and vote in our viewer polls. Learn all about our ongoing contest right there on your app. You can also submit news tips and photos. Also, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Crossroads Today. Hit that like button and click the notification bell. Stay with us coming up. A neighborhood in Houston hasn't received mail in almost a month. Their HOA has yet to help either. More in a moment. If you like low temperatures in the 60s, I've got some good news coming up in weather. Stay with us. Boeing Starliner capsule returned from the International Space Station Friday evening, concluding its nearly three month stay in space, but it flew back to Earth with an empty cabin, leaving behind two test pilots who must now remain in the station for another five or six months. Rob Kirkpatrick has more. Starliner is now over the landing site. Boeing Starliner capsule safely landed in White Sands Space Harbor in New Mexico Friday overnight. Touchdown. Starliner is back on Earth. Starliner is the first U.S. made capsule to parachute to the ground instead of the ocean. It was a good landing. It was pretty awesome. It was a great day today to return Starliner. It was great to have a successful undock, the orbit and landing of the vehicle. We're really excited to have Calypso back on the ground. The vehicle is now about two meters. Boeing Starliner returned without its two crew members, Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams. NASA deemed the capsule unsafe after a series of setbacks, including helium leaks and stop thrusters. We can operate. Now Williams and Wilmore will spend another five or six months aboard the International Space Station on what was originally supposed to be a 10 day journey into space. I'm sure ultimately that they both wanted what was best for the interest of NASA and for Boeing and that spacecraft. Honey, anything final? Maybe they were a little bit disappointed that they didn't get to go back home Just sooner, but happy to be here. this is something that they train for. They know that there's a chance they might stay in space longer. NASA said it is not clear what the path forward for Starliner is and how soon it could return to flight, as Boeing has spent billions of dollars in contracts from NASA for rocket production. Boeing is committed to continue their work with us. Now Boeing will rely on its competitor, SpaceX, to bring the crew back safely when it heads into space next year. I'm Rob Kirkpatrick reporting. People who live in a Northwest Harris County neighborhood say they haven't had mail delivered to them in nearly a month. They also say their HOA refuses to repair mailboxes that were destroyed after a car crashed into them. 
Oh, so I heard a what I what sounded to me like a small explosion, like something that hit this vehicle. Celeste Wardern was right. Something had, in fact, crashed into her and her husband's black Cadillac Escalade. But she never imagined it would be one of the cluster mailboxes that usually sits outside of their house. So I ran out here and saw a little red car. I guess he came around the corner a little bit too quick. Hit the mailboxes. All three components of their cluster mailboxes went flying. Right there. <laughs> That's one of them landed there, one of them landed there. Right there. Saturday will make one month since the crash and since the United States Postal Service stopped delivering mail to the boxes because they're unsecured. So we really have been having to go to the post office basically every week since then. A nearly seven mile drive from the warden's home. Celeste says she's tried multiple times to get the boxes repaired through Graham Management. The company, the Warderns, say manage their subdivision's homeowners association. And what did they say back to you? They said that it is our understanding that this is the personal postal annex responsibility to repair or replace the mailbox cluster. We tried calling for clarity. No help there or at the office we went to, but granted, it was after hours. However, the United States Postal Service responded to us partly saying, quote, postal regulations specify that the purchase, installation, maintenance, repair, and replacement of mail receptacles are the responsibility of the customer, in this case, the HOA. Local management is aware of the issue and will follow up with the HOA to resolve the matter as quickly as possible, end quote. In the meantime, people in this community and everyone else who gets mail through the United States Postal Service can sign up for what's called informed delivery by USPS. It allows you to see photos of your mail before it arrives for free. You can also track and manage your packages. The Warden say it's something they'll look into, yet and still. I think at the end of the day, the HOA needs to step up. In the Willowbridge subdivision, Devin Clark, KPRC2 News. For more on today's news stories, you can come to CrossroadsToday.com. Also, don't forget to submit your birthday wishes. Carolina Strain and Parker Cox will read them live on 25 News Now Sunrise. You can also submit a local military hero so we can recognize them. What impacts will the tropical disturbance have on the crossroads? We'll talk about that next in weather. Stay with us. And welcome back with the approach of this tropical disturbance. I want to talk about the potential impacts for the crossroads. Now, a lot of this depends on the exact track and how far the storm ends up being away from the coast. So again, these are just potential impacts. The timing for this should start around Tuesday and end sometime Thursday. It does include the entire crossroads and we can expect higher tides, winds, heavy rain, especially for coastal areas. Here is the big picture for all of this. We have this high pressure. This is the dry air that's pushing in right now. We have this frontal boundary that is eventually going to wash out. This is the low pressure down in the Bay of Campeche. You see that high pressure moving off to the east and that's going to 
create enough weakness for this low pressure to start to drift north. As it drifts north, it will eventually start to kind of follow this trough up here and start turning toward the northeast and sort of hug the Texas coastline. That's where the models agree. This general direction of the storm path, the models agree. But again, the exact path is still too early to determine. This is not even a closed low yet, and so the low has to close off for the models to perform better as far as the exact direction and intensity of the storm. So the key message right now is to just check back on a daily basis. Anytime we have a storm in the Gulf, you want to check back because things can change as we saw with barrel back in July. Feels like temperature right now 74 degrees. Look at that dew point 61. We are going down to the 60s, the upper 60s for lows tonight and plenty of visibility with clear skies. Here's those feels like temperatures. I'm going to stop it right here. 8 o'clock Sunday morning. A lot of 60s north, a few 70s along the coast. But other than that, a very dry, comfortable feel for tomorrow. And then when we get to the afternoon, middle to upper 80s, plenty of sunshine tomorrow. And then even Monday starts off nicely. We still have that dry air moving in, and then we'll start to feel that moisture creeping in around Monday afternoon as that system gets closer to us. We'll also see those temperatures really stay in the mid 80s all week with the clouds and rain. Here's the marine future tracker. Those winds pretty breezy if you're headed offshore tomorrow near 30 miles per hour and it doesn't let up much in the afternoon. Here is the afternoon and the evening still northeast between 25 and 30 miles an hour with higher gusts. And as the storm gets closer to us, this is Tuesday at 10 p.m. We could start seeing some coastal flooding, higher tides. Rip currents are always a threat. Those seas four to eight feet in the base choppy to rough with those winds still around 25 to 30 miles per hour. Your high tide, we do have a special uh, small craft advisory and then a high and low tide there, 456, 321. Again, those winds 15 to 25. Wake up temperature 74, pretty much the same temperatures for Victoria and for uh, Quero and then for the rest of the crossroads. Again, beautiful day tomorrow, then things start to deteriorate as the tropical low gets closer to us and expect tropical showers through the end of the week. Of course, you can download the Crossroads Today app, get the latest in news, weather, and sports at your fingertips, sign up for email alerts, and it's free. Here's Ray Robinson with sports. Thank you, Scott. Coming up in 25 News Now Sports, a CFL Week 2 recap, including the Battle of the Boot, which Victoria team won. I'll have that and more. Week two of high school football in the crossroads was very eventful. Many teams are in the search of making a statement in these non-conference games. So let's recap, shall we? We're starting with the game of the week. 
This one is all the way in Memorial Stadium. It's safe to say that both teams got the advantage in this battle of the boot. Quarterback Nolan Boyce was able to throw a pick on this first play and the, Titan, and the Titans take over. The Titans would respond with Carlin Helms rolling out his rolling out his finding star his finding star Braylon Vasquez tightens up 7-0 but that would not last as long as the Warriors running back Genesis Jeffrey scores not one but two touchdowns for the Warriors make the score 14 to 7 then quarterback Dominic Martinez ran for two touchdowns and man let's see what both scores are the final score was 41 to 28. And let's switch gears to Tidehaven. They were hosting the Goliad Tigers. The Tidehaven opened up with a scoring direct snap for, to Jason Duran for a physical touchdown run. Goliad marched back down the field to respond. Lamont Franklin punched it in from a short distance to tie the game back up to seven. Tidehaven took the lead back after a strong run by Angel Hernandez. Hernandez had a strong first half. He helped Tidehaven move the ball on the ground with physical running. Goliad pulls off the victory. Final score, 20 to 14. I was at the Yoakum versus Industrial, and here's a deep look into the game. Your week two of Crossroads Football Live saw me back in Vanderbilt, Texas, watching the Industrial Cobras host the Yoakum Bulldogs. The Yoakum Bulldogs being able to score in their first possession of the game. With 7.32 left in the first quarter, Donovan Toussaint leads the Bulldogs with a 50-yard drive and scoring after capitalizing on a fumble with five minutes left till halftime, the Cobras bounce back with a run downfield, ending in a touchdown from Nick Shuler, QB. The fourth quarter is where things really got underway. Cobras able to take the lead late in the fourth. A four-point lead from the Cobras with 6.48 left in the fourth quarter was abruptly ended by number eight, Jamar Hopkins. The Cobras prove that they are not going down without a fight. With 2.45 left in the fourth quarter, they score another touchdown from Cooper Martin. And a kick return to the Yoakum Bulldogs. Rod receiver Xavier Barnett returns it with 50 yards. Waiting all game for them to kick it to me. I was like, coming into the game, I was like, I hope they kick it to me. I'm taking it back to the crew. And last time they took, they, last time they kicked to me, I almost took it back. I was this close, just lift more blocks. I took it back. That play alone was enough for Bulldogs to score with a little help from QB Trey Cuellar. They, they kicked it to him, saw the hole open. Everybody was blocked. We got what we needed to do. Got us some momentum. Went down there and scored. A fumble on the play from the Cobras in the final seconds of the game summed it up, leaving Yoakum to walk away with the victory. Final score, 45 to 42. Man, we, we definitely had some adversity, but you know, we kept pushing through. Uh, defense probably got to stop, and we, we just executed. We did good. I, that was a good win. Big congratulations to the Yoakum team. That's it for your sports. Zach? Yeah, Yoakum's got another big one this week whenever they host the Quarrel Gobblers, one of the best rivalries in all of Crossroads football. Ray, thank you. Stay with us. Coming up, dozens of hot air balloons launched from Nevada this weekend. More in just a moment.
For all my hot air balloon enthusiasts out there, the great Reno Balloon Race kicked off on Friday. Organizers say it's expected to bring 150,000 people to Reno over three days. And I don't know about you guys, uh, if we tried to have a hot air balloon race, whatever it is that they've got going on out there, we'd probably melt as soon as we get up into that atmosphere. Scott, but it has been cooling down here lately in the crossroads. So is it, it's a great weather for all my hot air balloon enthusiasts out there. Take advantage of it. Get out. <laughs> enjoy the weather tomorrow. It's going to be fantastic. But then start paying attention on a daily basis as that tropical system moves closer to us. All right, Scott, thank you, Ray. Thank you as well. And thank you for joining us. Come to CrossroadsToday.com for more local news, weather, and sports. Have a great rest of your night.